Okay, so let's finish this. Uh, we know for each resource, there is a maximum amount of price that we are willing to pay for one additional unit. And that money, that amount of money, depends on the net benefit that one additional unit may give to us. For example, for wood, this price is 1.5. Okay, Because we know if there is one additional unit of wood for free to us, then I may earn $1.5 more. Okay? So as long as that price of this one additional unit of wood is less than this amount, then I would be happy. I will buy it. But for labor hours, this price is zero. Because no matter how many more labor hours I get, I will earn nothing more. Okay? Because the current bottleneck is the wood. Okay? So for labor hours, I can calculate that number, and that number is zero. Okay? For any kind of resource allocation problems, we may define something like this. So, this motivates us to define a special name for these things, to define shadow prices for constraints. Given any linear program that has any optimal solution, the shadow price of a constraint is the amount of objective value increased, okay? The amount changes, amount of changes in the objective value, given that the right-hand side of that constraint is increased by 1, assuming that the current optimal basis remains optimal. So let's read this statement again. I have an LP. There's an optimal solution. I then ask, what's going to happen if a given constraint for a given constraint, the right-hand side of that constraint is increased by 1. When the right-hand side changes, the objective value may also change, right? And the amount of the objective value increased is defined as my shadow price, okay? But we assume that the current optimal basis remains optimal. Okay, we're going to discuss this. But according to this definition, for our table chair example, the shadow prices for constraints 1 and 2 are 1.5 and 0 respectively. Okay, you may go back to verify. That's just the maximum amount of price we are willing to pay for those resources. If you want some more um, description about shadow prices, the related section is 4.7. So now, uh, there's one thing that we need to explain is about this assumption that the current optimal basis remains optimal. Let's see what does that mean. Suppose I have an example here, okay, another linear program. Graphical approach, optimal solution 4. If now we want to find the shadow price for constraint 1, what typically we should do is to add 1 to the right hand side. Right? So 4 becomes 5, okay? becomes 5. Here, the constraint shifts to the right, and the optimal solution should become 4.5. Okay, should become 4.5. In this case, the new optimal objective value actually goes to 13.5. So the shadow price seems to be 1.5. However, according to our definition, this is wrong. Okay? In our definition, we assume, we assume that the optimal basis remains optimal. Previously, the optimal basis, okay, um, here, the optimal basis remains the same means the set of binding constraints should, should still be the same. Okay, so here, this constraint and the non-negativity constraint gets the optimal solution. So if the current basis remains optimal, then we are talking about the point five zero. Okay, this point will be the new optimal solution if the current basis remains optimal. Okay, so by definition, the shadow price of constraint one should be three, not one point five. Okay, keep that in mind. And one more easier way to explain this is that, in fact, shadow prices are measuring the rate of improvement, okay? Not really what will happen when we add one more unit into the right-hand side, okay? That's just one uh, 
expression. But what we are really caring about is about the rate of improvement. Okay, so you may actually um, help yourself by thinking that when we calculate uh, shadow prices, we are adding a very tiny number to that right hand side uh, instead of really adding one. Okay, keep that definition in mind. All right, so now we have shadow prices. There are many interesting properties here. <coughs> As a shadow price measures how the objective value is increased, the sign is determined based on how the feasible region changes. Let's see this. Suppose I give you a linear program. If it is a maximization problem, then when we ask what's going to happen when a less than or equal to constraint, the right-hand side is increased, we know that's going to benefit the problem, right? I want the, I want the objective value to be larger. And then, if the constraint is a left, less than or equal to constraint, increasing the right-hand side will make the feasible region larger. Okay, will make the feasible region larger. And that's definitely a good thing. So that will go into make the objective value um, as larger or the same. It will not make things worse. Okay, but if this is a greater than or equal to constraint, when you increase the right hand side, then the feasible region would become smaller. And then that's not a good thing. Your objective value may decrease. Okay. On the other hand, if you are talking about a minimization problem, for a minimization problem, if your feasible region becomes larger, you can do better. Do better means to further decrease the objective value. And that's why if we measure the amount of increment in the objective value, it will be negative. Okay? But if the feasible region becomes larger, for a minimization problem, you will do worse and that means the objective value will somewhat increase. Finally, if you have an equality constraint and you modify the right-hand side, you have no idea about what's going to happen for the optimal as uh, for the feasible region, and so your shadow prices would be free. Okay, so according to the objective function, according to the constraint direction, we may immediately predict or make sure what will be the sign of our shadow prices? If you look at this table again and again, you will see that this is somewhat very similar to something we had in duality. Okay? Duality is saying that given different objective function and different primal constraint direction, the dual variable, the non-negativity, non-positivity, or free dual variable will be determined, okay? And immediately you will see shadow prices are directly connected with duality. Okay, so before that, let's say something more. Suppose I shift a constraint and that does not affect the optimal solution. Certainly the shadow price would be zero by definition, okay? So now we have a proposition. All those shadow prices are zero if the constraints are not binding at the optimal solution. Okay? Think about the, the example about chairs and the tables. When we give you one additional unit of labor hour, the shadow price is zero. Why? Because the labor hour constraint was non-binding at the optimal solution. Certainly this is true. When this constraint is non-binding at the optimal solution, Modifying it a little bit will not modify the optimal solution, and thus the objective the shadow price must be zero. So, we know finding shadow prices allows us to answer the question regarding additional units of resources, which is very good. But the question is, how may we find all the shadow prices? Or, if m is the number of constraints, is there a better way than solving m linear programs? The thing is that here I have m constraints. I may modify one constraint right hand side, solve it to get one shadow price, 
and then I may repeat the process for m times to get m trade prices. I just don't want to do that. And here, duality will help us to solve only one linear program, the dual program. For any linear program, the shadow prices will equal to the values of the dual variables in the dual optimal solution. In other words, the primal shadow prices are the dual optimal solutions. Suppose B is the old optimal basis and Z is this thing, right? According to the matrix algebra, will be the op old objective value. Now, suppose B1 becomes this. B1 becomes B1 prime, which is B1 plus 1. Then the Z value would become Z prime, which is CBAB inverse times B prime. And B prime is B plus this thing. All others are the same, but B1 becomes B1 plus 1. Okay, the first part goes back to the original z, and the second part would be for this uh, vector, the first element. Okay, the first element of this vector c b a b in uh, c b transpose a b inverse. Okay, so the shadow price of constraint one is the first element of c b transpose a b inverse, and also <coughs> in general. The ice constraint shadow price would be the ice component of CB transpose AB inverse. And as CB transpose AB inverse, what do we know about it? It's the dual optimal solution, right? It's the dual optimal solution according to our dual theorem. So the proof is complete. As long as we have this, as long as we have the dual solution, we have all the shadow prices. Okay, as an example, if I want to find the shadow prices for these two variables, uh, sorry, for these two constraints, all we need to do is to solve the dual program. I get an optimal solution for zero, and then that means the shadow prices for the primal problem would be four for constraint one, and zero for constraint two. Okay, so now we know duality. One immediate application of duality is that we may use duality to help us calculating all the shadow prices at once. We only need to sh solve one linear program instead of M to get all the shadow prices. Okay, so that's the end of our discussion about duality. Thank you.